Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Okay, do you want to tell him the good news? I or think do you, want you me to? should tell him. Okay, fine. So Garrett and I, I, I don't know if everyone was around for the last one, but we have decided to do another virtual live show. We did it last time. It was so much fun. It was one of the funnest nights. There was a live comment feed that we got to talk to everyone on as we told a live story and we have decided to do it again this month it will be july 31st the night of july 31st and you can purchase a ticket and then watch us tell a story live Uh, we will be interacting with you the whole time and there's a whole bunch of other fun bonus things we do and i think you are really going to want to be around to hear garrett hear the story i'm going to tell on this live episode you can go purchase a ticket now at a discounted price um they'll kind of raise as they get closer to the actual live date but last live was super fun and we have a theme that we're going to start doing for all our lives that is only going to be available on our virtual live shows we won't ever be doing another case like those again on our regular show and we won't be releasing it anywhere it'll just be on our exclusive correct you can go to momenthouse.com or you can also just we're going to have links all over they'll be on our website they'll be in all the podcast descriptions they'll be in our instagram bio tiktok wherever you are listening we're going to have a link somewhere so we have actually decided that the theme we're going to do on these virtual live shows are telling garrett the more infamous cases that we kind of all know but he's never heard of. And I wanted to save this for the lives because we do have the live comment stream going. And that way everyone can kind of jump in because everyone will be, not everyone, but some people will be more familiar with the case. And so I Mm -hmm. think it will be really fun to interact with people, but then also see your reaction to these cases that we all know and you clearly don't. And they are always the most shocking and most disturbing. So the case we are going to be covering at the end of July is the case of Casey Anthony. Now, I know that name probably sounds familiar to you, but Garrett. I feel like I've heard that name, but nothing. Nothing. So this is definitely going to be something you are not going to want to miss. So please join us at the end of July. Again, tickets are linked everywhere. And then also on momenthouse.com. It's virtual um, and it will be an exclusive episode to only that day. So yeah, I mean, the last one was a blast and I, I seriously can't wait for this. It one. was actually super fun. We was our first time doing it and we had a really good time. So we're super excited to do it again. Last one was like six months ago. Mm-hmm. So we don't do them very often. So please come if you can. All right. I don't know how you're going to one up that with your 10 seconds, but. All right. So I talked about before how I wear Vans. I've been on this like Nike kick lately and I've been buying a bunch of, they're not cheap. I just want to preface that, but a bunch of the Nike Dunk Lows. And I just bought my second pair. I don't have that many. I just have two, but I just bought a second pair and I don't know. I like them. And here's the thing is like, I feel like as a girl, I buy sh- different shoes. I've mm-hmm. my whole life. I've bought a whole bunch of different shoes. I never had this one pair of shoes that I wore with a lot of outfits. It was always changing my shoe upon what outfit I was wearing for you since I've known you, you've had like three pairs of shoes. Yeah, I've never been a shoe person. I'll wear like my same pair of Vans for, for a years, year, like yeah. three years. Yeah. So to me, it's like, okay, well, yeah, if you want to buy two pair of shoes, yeah, I, have I like mean, that's kind of fun because you're not really, you always just wear the same shoe. I know. So it's kind of nice to be able to switch things up. Yeah, that's fun. But other than that, I don't have much for you guys today. I'm sorry. I'm just, I have a cough drop in my mouth, so... I'll make sure you don't hear it in the mic. Don't worry. Other than that, my wife is looking pretty cute today. So it's got to throw that one out. <laughs> but we won't be too cringy and we'll hop right into it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Our case sources are Wikipedia, Murderpedia, Fine Law, WAMU.com, NBC4, Washington Post, CBSLocal.com, CBS News, WJLA.com, Go.com, Oxygen.com, a couple Google Books, a snapped Apple podcast episode, DignityMemorial.com, and State.MD.US. Our case this week begins on March 12th, 2011 in the Washington, D.C. suburb of Bethesda, Maryland. Now, we are actually outside of a local Lululemon Athletica store on Bethesda Row. So in preparation for this case, I said, Garrett, make sure to put on your Lululemon pants that your mom bought you. He has no idea why. 
but now you do. It's because we were outside of a Lululemon. So for those listeners who do not know what Lululemon is, um, according to Wikipedia, Lululemon Athletica is a Canadian athletic apparel retailer founded in 1998 as a retailer of yoga pants and yoga wear. They're from Canada? Yeah. And they have now expanded Mm. to athletic wear, lifestyle apparel, accessories, and personal care products. I do like Lululemon. I'm not going to lie. The company has 574 stores internationally and also sells online. So needless to say, they're a very big apparel company. But back on March 12th, 2011, the manager of this specific Lululemon store in Bethesda arrives a little before 8 a.m. that morning to open shop. I want to note here that from Google Images, Bethesda Row looks like a super nice and clean, cute shop street with stores lining both sides there's lights hanging from building to building it's very fun atmosphere okay but when rachel the manager arrives that morning she pulls out the store keys to unlock the door but then notices that the door is already unlocked this is odd but rachel assumes that someone had already come in earlier or maybe whoever closed had just forgotten to lock up rachel swings the door open and steps inside the lululemon store only to stop in her tracks once again not only are the store lights already on from what she can see the place kind of looks to be almost ransacked decor and clothing are thrown all over the ground cabinets are open rachel just stares at the scene in front of her so confused Had they been robbed? Rachel digs for her phone while cautiously calling out for anyone. Maybe it was a misunderstanding and another employee was already there. But that's when she heard the moaning coming from somewhere in the back of the store. Rachel was like, yeah, absolutely not. And mad dashed back out of the store and onto the street calling 911 to report it. While out there, she notices another person who was waiting outside of the neighboring Apple store for it to open. She explains to him that, you know, what had just happened in there and asks if he will go back in there with her to make sure no one's hurt because there was a moaning sound. Ryan, the man, has no idea what's going on, but he agrees to help and goes with Rachel back into the Lululemon store. Ryan pushes his way through the distressed storefront while Rachel waits back. It's only a minute before Ryan yells from the back of the store, call the police. I think someone is dead. Oh my gosh. Ryan had found a body lying face down. He tells Rachel there is also another person tied up in the bathroom who is barely breathing and he thinks she was sexually assaulted. Rachel immediately calls 911 again for the second time to report what they'd found in the Lululemon store. That's insane, just in the back of the store. Mm Mm-hmm. Montgomery County police respond to Rachel's 911 calls and arrive at the Lululemon store. They discover the store in disarray and the dead body in the back belonged to a 30 year old woman named Jaina Murray, an actual employee of the Lululemon store who had worked the closing shift okay. the night before. That's what my next question was going to be is, is it someone that works at the store? Right. She was now dead in the store, found laying in a large pool of her own blood. They also discovered 28-year-old Brittany Norwood, hands and feet zip-tied and visibly shaken in the bathroom. She had cuts all over her chest, her legs, her arms, and even her face. She had a deep wound on her right hand that ran parallel to her thumb. The store is covered in blood. Like I said, it's in huge disarray. And they discover two sets of bloody shoe prints, one big and one small, all throughout the store. Montgomery responders rushed Brittany to the hospital where once stable, she would later recount what had happened that night, having somehow lived to tell the tale. So I know we're going to get into it, but I assume because it's a retail store, there is cameras. There are not. They're not. No, and it's 2011, but there were no cameras in Lululemon. Okay. Brittany explained to police that her and Jaina were closing the store together that night, March 11th. Once they left, she realized that she forgot her wallet, and so she hurried and got a hold of Jaina and asked her to come back and unlock the store for her so she could go in and grab it. Brittany was a newer employee, and Jaina would have been considered a higher-up employee, so that's why she was the one with the keys after closing. While inside the unlocked store, Brittany described two masked men barging in and attacking both her and Jaina. 
Once the two masked intruders had control of the girls, they tied them up and then began sexually assaulting each girl. Brittany explained how Jaina began fighting back and resisting the assault. And that's when she says the men began beating her profusely. She says she watched as they eventually stabbed her friend and coworker to death. Brittany realized that at this point she was just going to do as they asked in hopes of not meeting the same fate as Jaina. And somehow they beat her, they cut her up with the knife, but nothing fatal enough to kill her. Okay. She was left tied in the bathroom with her hands above her head, waiting for morning to come. Police demand the hospital perform a sexual assault examination in hopes of retrieving DNA. And they leave Brittany at the hospital so they can start investigating and discover what awful vile people had done this. It was classified as a robbery turned homicide and attempted murder against these two women. Sorry, real quick. Why attempted murder? Like they killed somebody. Right. Well, they killed one. So it is homicide. Oh. But then um, Brittany lived. So that would be okay. attempted murder. Understood. Yeah, yeah. So it's both. So now I'm going to explain to you who Jaina and Brittany even are. Who are these two women? Jaina Troxel Murray was born on November 22nd, 1980 to David and Phyllis Murray in Wichita, Kansas. Her father was actually a former Vietnam veteran and ran a very tight, strict household. Jaina eventually made it through high school and actually attended St. Louis University in Madrid, Spain. For two years before coming back and graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree from George Washington University okay. in Washington, D.C. Jaina then began working on her Master of Communication and Master's in Business Administration from Johns Hopkins University, also in Washington, D.C. Her MBA master's thesis was on the corporate model of Lululemon, the athletic wear apparel store. This was her thesis because while getting her master's, Jaina worked as the sales team leader for Lululemon. Jaina was very interested in health and wellness, fitness. She led a very active lifestyle, hence why she even wanted to work work at Lululemon. Brittany Norwood was one of nine children. Her father actually owned an upholstery business, and although they didn't have much, hard work and education were taught heavily in the Norwood family home. Okay. By high school, Brittany was demonstrating good athletic skills and actually was recruited to play at Stony Brook University on scholarship as a defender on the women's soccer team. She started college in 2000 and played until 2003, when suddenly she was accused of stealing by not just her teammates, but also classmates and even roommates she definitely had a little problem with this but it was almost like something everyone was like oh yeah she just does that until it got too much it was almost a joke though okay. a former soccer teammate said norwood was her best friend in college she says we had a falling out because the girl was like a klepto adding that norwood stole money and a designer shirt from her she also said that norwood was very sweet very funny an amazing soccer player this was just her only downfall another teammate interviewed by abc news shared other girls on the team told me things like watch your locker keep it locked she's been known to steal things things. Okay. Either way, no charges were actually filed, but Brittany was thrown out of the school and obviously lo obviously lost her scholarship after all of these girls had come forward. That's really interesting. I don't I don't know where this is going yet. I'm just interesting. So after this mishap and not being able to graduate, Brittany Norwood moved to Washington, D.C. to live with her sister. There, she found success working at the front desk at the Williard Intercontinental Hotel, where she was quickly promoted to managing VIP guests. Okay. It was honestly a good job, but Brittany still had athletic ambitions and decided that she wanted to become a personal trainer. She began applying for jobs at fitness studios near the Lululemon store, and that's where she, how she eventually mm. ends up working at Lululemon. So while investigating the murder the day after it happened, Montgomery County police detectives continue to track leads and tips, but there seem to be no eyewitness accounts right off the bat. While all of this is happening, all the public knows is that there was an attack on two women and one was murdered and the other survived. Police released to the public that they are looking for two men, one around six feet tall and the other around five foot three inches tall. This was according to the surviving victim. So is Brittany a suspect? at this point no. i guess is my question no 
Okay. No, she's um, a victim. There were no security cameras and no evidence of a break-in because the men had used the unlocked doors left open by the girls. Okay. The store owners offered a $125,000 reward to anyone who could help police find, apprehend, and convict the two male suspects. I still cannot believe that there weren't any cameras. I know. When I, when I blows figured my mind. that out, I was like, Garrett's going to have a panic I attack. I know for sure that Apple Store next door had cameras. So there were cameras on the did. street, okay, like on Bethesda Row, but there weren't cameras inside of Lululemon. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's crazy. So now again, Bethesda Row is described as a celebrated upscale mall offering a variety of trendy retail shops, restaurants, and a movie theater. Within the complex is upstairs at Bethesda Row, a development of luxury trendy condos for residents to go downstairs to explore. So all this shopping on the main level and then all of this luxury housing above it. Now, I do have a question. Where you grew up, were there Apple stores in 2011? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Definitely. Yep, okay. I were. didn't know if this was like some before it's time thing that there was a Lululemon and an Apple store yeah, yeah, or if this was Apple common because uh-huh. that definitely was not in my hometown. Yeah, there was two that I knew that were, were pretty close. Okay. Yeah. We were still just rocking like, I mean, Hollister was a big deal yeah, when yeah. we got that yeah. at my mall. <laughs> So like buckle just came into your literally, mall. literally, we were just like a Macy's Dillard's yeah, type yeah. mall. So the murder itself really unsettled this previously quiet and low crime, almost crime free suburb of Bethesda. Okay. When I looked up how safe is my town searches for Bethesda, it revealed that it was a town with a much lower crime rate compared to average America and even had an A plus when it came to crime. So this was just very rare for this specific neighborhood. Because of this, the community plans a vigil for Jaina on Bethesda Row while Brittany is still recovering. So it's March 18th, 2011, one week after Brittany and Jaina were attacked at Lululemon. The vigil begins in remembrance of Jaina at the Mindfulness Center in Bethesda. Dr. Deborah Norris led a meditation and Reverend John Love led a prayer. But as the beautiful remembrance is happening, whispers begin filling the room, quiet chaos ensuing. Brittany Norwood, the survivor, was just arrested and charged with first degree murder in okay. Jaina's death. That's you felt it going there. Exactly. Yes. I felt it. That's why I asked that question. I think just because the way you explained her past um, doesn't always make you a suspect. I guess I'm trying to think how often does someone brutally kill someone and then leave the other person alive? Yes. I, probably not very often. Unless like maybe she got stabbed and was like barely breathing, but that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. She was cut in a few places and she seemed quote unquote, I mean, she seemed perfectly fine. Right. And I mean, it's it's very rare that I would share a hard part of someone's life if they're a victim, if Correct. it didn't pertain to the story. Yeah, yeah. So, but I it, I had to include it, mm-hmm. but you know, it was hard. While I was writing the script, it was hard. Interesting. Okay. So she just got arrested. She just got arrested. Um, apparently there was no masked intruders. It was just Brittany and Jaina, two Lululemon workers closing up the prestigious yoga store when everything turned not so namaste. How did they prove that? So you literally, what did police know that Mm -hmm. the public didn't? It had only been a week. Like what had happened in this last week that the public had no idea about? Police weren't going to tell anyone. They They weren't talking to the media. Those details would only come out at Brittany Norwood's trial seven months later. So imagine being in this town where there's hardly any crime and you're like, oh my gosh, these two Lululemon workers were attacked. One barely survived, the other died. And then the police a week later, like, never mind, we arrested the yeah. other girl for it. And then you have to wait seven months to figure out why. Yeah, something's going on. So while waiting for trial to actually begin, the same Lululemon store that had been boarded up and closed since the day of the murder reopened in June of the same year. Kate Marie, Jaina's sister, and her parents, David and Phyllis, were at the store's reopening where a stained glass mosaic with the word love in cursive was unveiled above the entrance in remember of Jaina. So when they reopened the store, they redesigned the whole thing to honor her. They said, today is such an honor for Jaina. Today is a day she is turning cartwheels in heaven. Okay. Which just, I mean... 
according to them, Lululemon was very important to Jaina. It had been her thesis. She had been working there. She loved it there. So I'm really happy that the store decided to try and honor her. In April, her parents also came out and told media that they are just as confused as everyone. They claim Jaina never even mentioned Brittany. They didn't even know who this girl was. Um, What could have gone so wrong that she killed her if they weren't even close enough for Jaina to bring her up? Then finally, after back and forth trying to plead insanity, Brittany Norwood is charged with first degree premeditated murder and second degree specific intent to kill murder. Her trial starts on October 26, 2011, and the details that emerge shock everybody. Jaina Murray and Brittany Norwood had been co-workers for only three weeks at the Bethesda Row location, Lululemon, and were working together the night of March 11th, 2011. They closed the store and left the building that night. According to witness statements, Jaina performed a bag check on Brittany before leaving. Now, a bag check is a common practice used in many scenarios, but also on employees. An upper employee asks to check all of the employees' bags before everyone leaves just to make Make sure no one is stealing product. It's just something they do. This can also be done to customers as well. You can say, please let me check your bag before you leave the store. But this specific night, Jaina performed one on Brittany. Jaina saw stolen yoga pants in Brittany's bag that she didn't pay for. And if you remember, she has a history with stealing. She literally lost her scholarship and got kicked out of school for this. It's unclear whether Jaina confronted Brittany about it or if there was just an awkward silence as Jaina handed them back to Brittany. Either way, Jaina knew that this new employee, Brittany, was stealing a pair of yoga pants. We don't know if she was like, hey, you need to return these. We don't know how that specific exchange went. We know this, though, for sure that she knew because Jaina then called another Lululemon employee to ask if Brittany had bought those pants from her, like maybe you did sell them to her. Um, And she was like, no, no one sold her those pants. So we know she was definitely suspicious. Both girls closed up shop and left for the night. Around 9.51 p.m., Brittany calls another sales associate for Lululemon and claims that she left her wallet back at the store. Because they barely know each other, Brittany didn't even have Jaina's number and needed needed to get it from Mm -hmm. this other employee. She then called Jaina and asked her to come back to the store to let her in so she could get her wallet. And this is how premeditated came into play because they had already left the store. Got it. So for her to find a ruse to bring her back to the store is how the state is saying this was premeditated. I guess I'm confused because wouldn't premeditated just be murder? First degree murder? Yes, but she could have been charged with second degree murder if they had just broken out into a fight in the Lululemon. I guess what I'm asking, is there a difference between first degree murder and premeditated murder? Okay, as you guys know, I am not an expert. So I just looked it up on lawarena.com. It says... First degree murder is the most severe form of murder defined in the U.S. legal system. In these cases, the murder is committed with malice a forethought. In other words, the crime was committed with the intent to cause harm to and kill the victim with no regard for human life. The unlawful killing must also be premeditated for it to be deemed first degree murder. Okay. So yes, I would assume that if it's premeditated, it's, it's first, first degree, degree murder. murder. Okay. They go hand in hand. So on March 12th, the day they were found, Detective Deanna Mackey met with Brittany at the suburban hospital to get her statement. Everyone, including Detective Mackey, considered Brittany a victim at this point Mm -hmm. and truly just needed her story and help in finding a suspect. During this interview, the story about the mass intruder comes out and Detective Mackey notes the incredible detail Brittany was using to describe the supposed attack. She claimed that she was assaulted with a clothing hanger from the store and that's why when she was found the crotch of her pants were torn but the hospital reported back to police that Brittany's examination revealed no evidence of sexual assault Mm. now I tried to look up statistics on this because I don't want to jump to conclusions but I really couldn't find any I kind of feel like we need more details details here to clarify what no sign of it actually means does this mean there were no signs of sexual activity at all does this mean there were no signs of violent sexual assault does this mean there was no dna like i don't actually know what concludes a negative sexual assault examination because there are times where just because sexual activity was violent doesn't mean it was an assault right so it can be kind of confusing 
But I'm assuming because she clarified they used a hanger and there were no signs of sexual assault, this is a different story because there would most assuredly almost be violent sexual assault in that case. So after this, on March 14th, two days later, Detective Dimitri Reuven and James Drury were asked to speak with Brittany at her home. At this point, they still think she's a victim. So even okay. though the hospital said there was no signs, it didn't really sway them. Brittany cried to detectives while revealing even more details about her supposed attack. Police still considered Brittany a victim at this point. On March 16th, two days later, police again asked to meet Brittany at the station to collect her fingerprints and hair samples for elimination purposes. Police sit her down for questioning while she's there. Now, in the past two days, police have grown suspicious of Brittany. Um, I even believe that they found DNA evidence against her inside of Jaina's car. But Brittany's story never put her in Jaina's car. So I think that they bring her in this time to figure out why there was evidence she was in her car. It's just crazy to me to think that, like, the average person can just kill someone. You know what I mean? Like, that yeah. it's not someone who, I don't know, she's just... She's working in Lululemon. Right. And then she just kills her coworker. Well, and you're about to find out that she didn't just kill Jaina. She slaughtered oh Jaina. Oh, my god! Like, okay. it, it definitely is not an average person okay. thing. So they ask her up front, have you been inside Jaina's car? Or do you even know what kind of car Jaina drives? And Brittany's like, no, I have no idea. Okay. Police are like, okay. And they, they, they end the interview. They don't want to make her think they're suspicious. Yep. The next day, Brittany's family calls police and said that Brittany had confessed some more details about the attack and had kind of been withholding the information, afraid that the suspects who were still on the loose were going to come back and harm her. So specifically, one of those details was that in the middle of the attack, the suspects untied Brittany and forced her to go outside on her own, get in Jaina's car, move it, and come back in. Okay, so now she's starting to realize... Well, maybe they had evidence oh, of me being in there. Oh, wait a second. I forgot to tell you that I had to go get in her car and just hang out while they were killing her. Okay, so the next day, March 18th, police bring her back in for questioning. And she's the one who initiates the conversation about moving the car to a uh -huh. different parking lot. And there's actually parts of this interview online, not the whole thing, but just sections of it. And she says the reason she didn't just get in the car and go find help was because the attackers had seen her home address on her ID and she was scared they would oh find her. Oh my gosh. But then she goes on to say, I even passed a cop while moving her car. And I, I didn't do anything. I just parked the car and went back into the Lululemon to be attacked. Oh, it's over. It's, yeah, it's over at this point. And so police are like, Brittany, this doesn't make sense. This absolutely makes no sense. Your story makes no sense. So during this interview, Brittany is growing frustrated and tired and she wants to go home. So at this point, police confront her with all of the evidence they had collected that I'm going to tell you about. And then also say, we found evidence you were in her car. Your story doesn't make sense. We, we're suspicious of you. Yeah. Eight different murder weapons were used in the murder of Jaina. Oh my God. And this was the evidence they had found that led them to arrest her just a week after. This is what they had been working on the last six days. It was a rampage, a bloodbath, brutal, brutal murder. She sustained at least 332 separate injuries from the attack. Holy crap. She had 105 defense wounds. So eight different weapons. Like what What happened? Some of them were a hammer, a wrench, merchandise peg, box cutters, rope. All of that was oh. found. It was already in the store. She was hit in the head with a one foot metal bar from a shelving rack inside Lululemon. And this shattered her skull. Her spine was also broken. Mm -hmm. Like she had just, it was awful. I don't want to go into all of the details, but yeah, I also think it's important to show that this was, this was awful mm -hmm. and this is really evil. All of Brittany's injuries were superficial. So the, when she was found, they were, you know, nothing tragic except for Jaina was like brutally murdered. Yeah. And so they were kind of like, this doesn't match up. This doesn't even look like the same attacker did these. Also, half of the bloody shoe prints belonged to Brittany. Okay. And the shoe she was wearing. The other half, the big ones came from a size 14 display shoe 
found inside the store at Lululemon. What an idiot. I don't even know what else to say. Like, Well, this means Brittany grabbed the shoe, and used dipped it. it in blood, and pranced around the store, placing the shoe prints where she could to try to say, oh, a different person came in here and then left the shoe there with the bloody sole. And then tied herself up. Yes. She then bound her own feet and her hands and spent all night laying in the store next to Jaina's corpse, next to this girl who she'd only known for three weeks that she just brutally murdered. Because she was really trying to sell it. Yes. Yes. She was committed at that point. Right. Employees at the Bethesda Apple store, which adjoined the Lululemon store. Now, this part of the story, I mean, there's a lot of parts of this story. This part of the story is confusing, so I'll just preface that. So this is the store right next to Lululemon. They share a wall. Testified that they heard noises coming from the Lululemon store after 10 p.m. This is, it says, I heard noises coming from the right side of the store, something heavy sounding, an Apple employee said, like it was being hit or dragging, grunting, some thudding. The Apple store manager at the time also testified that he heard panting, like when you can't breathe and you need to catch your breath. Oh, we just don't help. We don't call anyone. So the employee continued to hear noises, including, this is what they testified, screaming and yelling. The employee heard one female voice which sounded hysterical and another female voice saying, talk to me. Don't do this. Talk to me. What's going on? The employee. So sad. The employee heard additional screaming, yelps and yells. um, Basically, please help me. Please help me. And then it all kind of the, the Apple store employees left after 11 PM, but this was all happening during that whole time. So I'm just so confused. I'm not going to blame anyone because it's not, they didn't, they didn't kill anyone, but what happened? Well, and it's like, this is why I was saying it's confusing. And again, I don't want to place blame on anyone no, either. Not at all. And I don't know what I would do in that situation. I mean, I, I guess if you're in it, it might be different. Well, so they said their excuse was, we just thought it was some drama going on at Lululemon, mm. which I mean, I don't know about pleading for help and th- panting and thudding. I don't know. All I know is like, sometimes we have kids who live in our neighborhood and sometimes in the middle of the day i'll hear a scream and i'll be like garrett oh my gosh go check go check make sure there's not a kid getting kidnapped out there and he's like true. they're just playing yeah, so true. i am very aware of sounds and i also am not embarrassed i'll walk out and make sure that the kid is okay make mm-hmm. sure that they are just harmless playing there's nothing going on they're not getting attacked by a dog they're not getting kidnapped i am very aware of that but i also listen to a lot of true crime mm-hmm. so i don't know i i I don't want to speak any more on it, but I found it important to share that this was testified at trial. No, I agree. So there was also a security guard at Bethesda Row, but he was wearing headphones and was inattentive to the situation, didn't hear anything. So it's unclear, however, how no one else called 911 that night. And the defense would actually go on to use this testimony to say it wasn't a brutal blood bath as the state was claiming if it had been they would have definitely called 911 it wasn't as big a deal as everyone's making it out to be like Mm -hmm. so they kind of used this testimony against them at trial the jury was shown all of this evidence they heard phone calls they also watched video footage of Brittany originally claiming not to know the type of car Jaina drove then to confessing to moving it so they could say hey she lied At this point, Brittany knew she couldn't deny doing it. There was too much evidence. So she claimed it was all self-defense. Oh, my God. That the pair of pants had caused a fight and that she had killed her in self-defense. The jury spent less than an hour deciding that Brittany Norwood was guilty, claiming the evidence was overwhelming, which it was. Oh, 100%. She was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. At her sentencing, which you kind of just said this, the judge said, you're one hell of a liar, ma'am. After every blow, you had a chance to think about what you were doing. So why though? Like, did they say, there has to be a why. There's gotta be a reason. The motive was because she had just got the job and now she just got caught stealing pants and she just barely been kicked out of school for stealing. So maybe she thought, I have to eliminate the worker who's found this out because I can't go through another life change where i'm fired for stealing her brain just turned off yeah oh i'm gonna kill someone so i can get out of stealing pants that's what they assume the motive is but they have no there's nothing else she never said i mean she she's the one who even said that she had killed her in self-defense because of the pants okay so i'm assuming that it's probably right if that was her story as well okay 
Jaina was described as someone who loved animals. She loved dancing and traveling. Jaina lived life on the edge and to the fullest. Jaina was laid to rest on Saturday, March 19th, 2011 in Forest Park, the Woodland Cemetery in Montgomery County, Texas. Her memorial page contains a lot of pictures of her, including several more shared on the Find a Grave page. And I say it all the time, they will be linked. Um, but it really is nice to just go read what her friends and family have said about mm -hmm. her. It makes these victims seem very real and it not it doesn't just feel like a story so it, you know i would highly suggest doing it if you want yeah. to in 2017 the previous lululemon store was being moved to a new location so uh the store this had all happened and decided to move and as part of the demolition they actually cut out and gave jana's family the stained glass window that was put up in her honor and News 4 spoke to Jaina's brother, Hugh, and he said, it obviously means a lot to us as it represents Jaina. We definitely wanted pr to preserve that and have it in our home. They, he then said that Lululemon shipped it to Hugh, who now lives in Richmond with his children who were born after Jaina died. But I just also, Jaina's family was very, um, you know, just celebratory of Jaina. And yeah. I think that that is how they would want us to remember her today as you know just a girl who was ambitious i mean she was her education was unreal she just had a lot going for her and was taken so unfairly so i want to spend today you know honoring jana so that was the case of jana murray it's also crazy to me that you talk i feel like i just repeat the same things but she beat her to death basically right? yeah she basically beat her to death. she, she didn't just shoot her and it was one and done she kept hitting her. She kept stabbing her. She kept hurting her over and over and over again. It is awful. Which is just unbelievable to me. It's, unbelievable. We see it all the time in these cases. Just it, we can't fathom it, which is why we are fascinated by it, which is why we were we are sitting here going, how could someone do this? I mean, this case was highly, highly suggested. I mean, Garrett even said when um when I said, are you wearing your Lululemon? He was like, does this have to do with the Lululemon murder? And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, I've seen it suggested a lot. So mm -hmm. I hope that this, you know, this one was for everyone who had suggested that we cover Jaina's yeah, yeah. story. I felt like I was, ooh, I thought it was going to be a little longer and more like complex, but it seemed pretty straightforward. And I think it's because the police were, seemed like they were just on top of it. Right. A week after. I mean, there's, yeah. Especially because a lot of these stories where it's like, it's been 10 years and then we had to go through all the detail of it sparking back up and then another 10 years. This was like six days and police were like, I mean, and granted, there was a lot of evidence yes. that was clearly pointing to her. Um, but yeah, police were definitely on top of it. Yeah. And the trial was fast. Everything was quick. Okay, you guys, thank you so much for listening to us week after week. I mean, it seriously means everything. And we will see you guys next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.